This is the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast, the only podcast devoted to making soul music relevant again. Let's get started with your host, Todd Woodson. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast. My special, special, special guest today is a true Bay Area legend when it comes to radio. Her name is Diane Blackman. Miss Blackman, how are you doing today? I am wonderful, Todd. It's so very nice to be in the house with you this afternoon. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. And uh, trust me, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, I feel like uh, we just met recently, but I feel like because we're both from the Bay Area and because you were such a iconic figure in uh, Bay Area music, I feel like I, I know everything it is about you. And I know that ain't true. Well, you know the Bay Area, we are definitely one family, even if we're not blood related. Everybody's a cousin. So <laughs> I, I definitely understand what you say. And I also didn't realize until a few minutes ago that... Um, that you were born in the same city I was born in, Vallejo, California? That's amazing. Wow, Very small world, right? find people that are actually born in California, but specifically in Vallejo. Yeah. And Vallejo General really took me over the top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, so for those who aren't from the Bay Area and um, aren't familiar with um, Bay Area radio, um, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but tell us a little bit more about uh, Diane Blackman. Well, Diane Blackman was, like you say, born and raised in Vallejo, California, went to Salal College for a couple of years, and then went on to a broadcasting school back in the uh, early 70s. You had to have an engineering first class license to even be a radio broadcaster. Mm -hmm. So I went to school, uh, got my engineering uh license, uh, which was the first class FCC uh, engineering license. And on the way back and forth to school, we passed the blue, blue building that sat on the side of the Bay Bridge uh, with big call letters that said KDIA. And uh, as you know, being a Bay Area guy, uh, radio uh, personalities were a huge thing to the Black community back in those days. And really our uh, avenue for information, news, consciousness, and all of that came from Black Radio. So as I drove back and forth to school, uh, I was listening to KDIA on, on the radio and all the jocks, the Bob Jones and the uh, Chuck Spruggs and the, all of the legends. And so I decided to possibly stop by to see if I could get a job. And uh, the program director at that time was Bernie McCain, and he told me if I finished school and uh, got my first class FCC license, he would put me on the air. And uh, I did, and he did, and I became the first uh, black female announcer engineer in California or west of the rock. Wow, uh, very impressive. Yeah, I was excited. What made you, uh, what, why radio? What made you go into radio? I couldn't sing or dance, and I loved entertainment. And uh, my mother always told me my mouth would be the, the <laughs> end of me. So I utilized my skills, my verbal skills, and I always, just, I always thought about finding a need in film. And at that time, there were no female uh, broadcasters west of the Rockies. They did have a few on the East Coast, Mary Mason, and a couple of others, but there were no uh, black broadcast, black female broadcasters. Mm -hmm. So I decided to uh, set my sights on that and become And that's kind of how I got it. Literally, I couldn't sing in dance, and I loved it. Okay, so you wanted to be in music. It was just, like you said, you yes. could. Yes, entertainment. And I, I like the, the fact that 
we could educate and entertain. I always like that aspect of black radio or soul radio or Negro radio is that that was the vehicle in that time frame that all black people uh, turned to for insight and information. And so I, I always liked the part of educating and entertaining uh, my people. And I've always been, you know, a closet revolutionary. <laughs> so that was a, a way of uh, meshing both together and moving uh, our entire culture forward. Okay. So was um, was KDIA your your first position in uh, in radio? Absolutely, I was the youngest uh, jock that they had ever hired, uh, nineteen years old, and it was my first major market radio position. Okay, now thinking back, did you? Oh, uh, I take that back. Okay. I take that back. It was my first paid radio position. Gotcha. I actually uh, through. Uh, Solano College uh, took an intern program there and I started at Cape NBA radio in Palaya. Right. At the time it was a, a totally white station and it takes the country and western of the and so for a couple of hours a week they would allow the students to bring in their own music and create their little DJ shows and I literally almost shut Vallejo down because <laughs> that audience had never <laughs> heard what they call in those days race music. So after a couple of hours, the phones were blowing up and the, uh, the owner of the station was perplexed and, you know, that was kind of the beginning. Needless to say, I didn't last long there and uh, from there went on and decided to uh, get my license and then first. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I remember um, our church was on KNB, uh, was it KNBA for years. Um, 11 o'clock Sunday morning to I think 1230 or something like that. What, what church did you attend? Good Samaritan. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we was on there Yeah, for years. Absolutely, yeah. And I remember I remember the, uh, the KDIA off of the... Um, off of the uh, the Bay Bridge, mm -hmm. and it always looked like just a shack. And I was like, "This is KDIA." I was just amazed when we used to go to San Francisco, and I was like, "That's KDIA." Exactly. Yeah. exactly. This little blue shack building that sat at the end, literally on the dock of the yeah. bay. Yeah. Um, yeah. One road in and one road out. <laughs> um, I read somewhere that. Um, Sly Stone actually worked there too. Oh, absolutely! Sly worked at KDIA and KSL. Oh wow! So a little Barry history. And a Vallejo boy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Look at Vallejo making our imprint in the world. <laughs> All right. So how long did you stay at uh, KDIA? Uh, a couple of years at KDIA the first time. Uh, then I transferred to KSL. Uh, which was the number one FM station during that time. Uh, about a year and a half at KSOL, and then I went to Philadelphia. Mm. Uh, Bernie McCain, the gentleman that brought me into radio at KDIA, was transferred to WHAT in Philadelphia. And uh, called and asked me, did I want an afternoon slot in Philadelphia? So after I went to the map, to find out where Philadelphia was. <laughs> I thought, hey, you know, and then I talked to Bob Jones and he said, if you go to Philadelphia and stay for a couple of years, what you learn on the East Coast and East Coast radio, it would take you five to 10 years to get that type of knowledge and training on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. So that was all I needed. I packed my bags and I headed for the city of Philadelphia. Okay. And so from HAT, I went to uh, WCAU FM, which was the CBS affiliate at that time in Philadelphia, and became the first black female broadcaster engineer um, for CBS radio in 1975. Oh, okay. Wow. So there's a lot of firsts in your life. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was a pioneer. Okay. A trailblazer. I hear you. <laughs> well, that's why we want you on the show. Um, so speaking of that, what's the difference between West Coast Radio at that time and radio on the East Coast? East Coast Radio was far more progressive uh, than West Coast Radio. I don't know if it was because of the pioneering aspect of West Coast Radio, which kind of means uh, there was a lot of race issues. You know, there was in those days uh, black or soul radio, and then there was pop and country on Western and middle of the road. And the East Coast had far more uh, Black-owned, Black-ran radio stations in California. Literally, if you didn't get a job in Oakland, which was KBIA, or uh, San Francisco Bay Area, which was KSOL, you had no more opportunities as a Black broadcaster in California. Whereas on the East Coast, you know, you had everything from Philly to Baltimore to D.C. to New York, and everything in between. And mostly every major city and minor city had their own black radio station and so there were far more opportunities uh, for black broadcasters and female broadcasters they were a little ahead of the game because i was the first female broadcaster in 74 whereas you had your louise williams and mary mason and by higgins out of new york who had been on the air for a decade so that was uh, the main reason they were just more progressive. Uh, you know, the East Coast has a larger black population. Yeah. So black radio were, were, was huge. You know, they were the number one station in the markets, uh, beating out even your ABC and CBS. Black radio ruled uh, from probably the 60s until the midnight. Okay. All right. And um, so you were in Philadelphia and, and you were in the heart of, I guess. Oh, yeah. One of the, the I don't know, some of the, the greatest R&B soul acts. To oh, yeah. Come out, well, I came, came out of Philly. Philadelphia. So that was really the, the heyday mm. of, uh, of uh, Philadelphia sound and, and uh, uh the great artists from the Harold Melvins and the Blue Notes to the OJs to Billy Paul, you name it, TSOP. So coming out of California, landing in Philadelphia at that time was just perfect. Uh, Teddy Pendergrass was taking off. It, it was just an exciting time. Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff, you know, uh, Sigma Sound. It was just the epitome of black music uh, at that time and, and the philly sound was good yeah I, yeah, I it think, was a great time to be yeah i uh i think um you know the philly sound and motown are like neck and neck and exact artists exactly I mean, exactly they are that's the that's the landmark that's the bridges those are the two one uh you know they did come out of detroit of course but basically made a, their presence in los angeles you had the West Coast with Motown and then the East Coast with the Philly Sound. That was total, that that was it. You know, <laughs> it didn't get much better than that. <laughs> it really didn't, but yeah, the, it, it was a remarkable time uh, in Philadelphia. It actually was, I guess the 100th anniversary was 76. Mm -hmm. So with West all Indiana. of that going on and, and the music scene, it was an exciting time. Okay. Now, some of the artists that we just mentioned out of uh, Philly, um, you mentioned that you um, you met Teddy Pentecost when we were talking. I think a couple of weeks earlier, a couple of weeks ago, and I was telling my mom was just when TP came out, she was in the zone. I mean, you just couldn't say nothing until you know he was off the radio. So, what was it like meeting Teddy Pentecost and all those other stylistics and the dramatics and um, I even think uh, Frankly Beverly is out of Philly too, and all those artists that just came out of Philly, man, I mean, these are uh, uh, just the richest that are in that city. It was phenomenal. 
because I was young. I think uh, I went to Philly at 20, 21. So of course I'm a fan. I grew up listening to all of these legends. Um, actually, Teddy Pendergrass was a part of Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. Right. Um, and so I knew him as the drummer and then from the band to become the lead vocalist. So just to be, uh, just to witness, I think the rise of stardom it is a, a unique and particular position to be in. And, and back in, in those days, uh, radio announcers and DJs were held in very high esteem. So everyone came to the station. Everyone was very uh, generous with their time. I, Teddy Pendergrass, I can remember uh, Valentine's Night on CBS radio, him coming to the station to show me a brand new Rolls Royce with a big box of candy and flowers. But artists did that a lot for DJs because for not us, there would be no them because in those times, most R&B artists could not uh, get their records played on pop or turban or white radio. So they they held radio announcers and DJs in high esteem. So yeah, everybody made sure that they acknowledged us, they thanked us, and whatever they could do to show their appreciation back then. They did. Okay. Um, and I know a lot of those uh, acts um, actually, you know, became mainstream too. I mean, there was those artists were big, not just in the black community, but uh, all over, right? Well, absolutely. That's one of the things that Black Radio did. They were the A and R for soul music. So we literally cultivated our stars. We um, shielded them. We made sure that only their best efforts were put forth. And yes, we literally groomed them for a pop market. Now, the thing that's interesting is pop only went on to R&B after they lost their numbers with country and Western and classical and pop. And black artists literally became the biggest artists in the industry because uh, young, you know, kind of like the story of rock and roll young white kids start listening to soul music and so they stop listening to the pop stations and they all listen to the R&B station, which made the R&B station go to number one. And a lot of the R&B acts cross over mm -hmm. into the pop arena. Okay, all right. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, how long- As you remember, were... James Brown didn't really go pop until living in America. He had been performing for 40 years before living in America. So what were what was the number one or top 10 or top 20 on the R&B charts did not necessarily equate to the top 10 or 20 on the pop charts. Right. So you could be number one in R&B and never reach the pop charts. Right, okay. What, um, so how long were you in, in Philadelphia? I was in Philadelphia about five years. Uh, came out uh, about 80, 81. Went back. Did I go back to KSL? I went back to KSL Radio and back to KDIA. So I literally left Philly, came back to the Bay Area, worked uh, KDIA, KSOL uh, for just three or so years. And then I landed down here in Los Angeles, uh, where I hooked up with uh, my ex-husband and partner, Lou Bailey, and we started producing national syndicated programming. Oh, okay. Including radio, scope, entertainment magazine, the air, hip hop countdown and report, uh, the Black University Radio Network, uh, Sports by Gospel Insider, and a number of other programming, and that. I stayed and literally that's where I've been, but this is where I've been since uh, 1980. Okay. How has, uh, I think I know the answer to this, but how has uh, radio changed um, from the time, let's say not even going back that far, let's say from the 90s until now, how has, uh, how has radio 
because I know hip hop is big now. So how is radio? Has radio had an effect on R and B music? Well, I think the decline of black radio has had a tremendous effect on R and B music. Uh, it's literally hard to find. What happened in the nineties uh, with the consolidation of your big uh, syndicated networks, the uh, uh, premier radios and the ABC radio networks, is they went and they started buying up all uh, small black radio stations. Now, the problem is with black radio stations was you could be the number one station as far as audience ratings, but as far as advertisers were concerned, you were still classified as a black station. So general market advertisers did not give the support to radio and advertising dollars. And that's kind of how radio works. Advertisement pays for all of the overall cost of radio. If you don't have the advertisers, then you kind of are, are pushed out of the market. And so they put a stranglehold on black radio after they started the rolling back all of the uh, initiatives that had been put forth uh, during the civil rights movement, the affirmative action. And so once the, the dollars from advertising went away, black radio stations were struggling to pay bills. So consequently, they either lost them or they were forced to sell them to white conglomerates. Once the white conglomerates got them, they kept the black music, but they put a white or Asian or other person in management position. When I started radio, uh, there were no black, uh, white people at KDIA. Not jocks, not sales, not front office, general manager, program director, music director, was all black. When I went to KSOL, there was one white gentleman who had art company and one Asian. Everybody else was completely black. Now it has totally flipped. The one white gentleman that was the part-time uh, person uh, at KDIA, he's the only one that has lasted through the last 40 years. He became program director, this and that, but everybody else is gone. So the biggest difference is that black radio no longer exists. Black music exists, but the people behind the scenes have, the faces have changed. So consequently, we lost black radio and we never could really get into pop radio, you know, except the only one, the one. I was the only black person uh, that K, uh, WCAU, the CBS had ever hired. Um, so if you got into a general market, you were on, the only black. But black radio kind of just got wiped out um, with the crossover and the homogenizing of uh, radio. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, <coughs> Kind of the way the way I, I know you advertising is so big and um, it kind of strangles you if you can't you know generate the dollars and you're forced to sell well you know as a producer you know uh and a programmer that if you don't get the funding you can't keep the staff you can't do the promotion the marketing and unfortunately like you say kdia with that little shack building on the side where all of this talent was and all of these major careers were built even in music but that's what they were limited to you know because of the advertising dollars and like i said back then they were black advertising dollars and what they call general market uh, advertising dollars and although uh black radio had the largest listenership our listeners were counted like a third of what white listenership was. So if, say for instance, KFRC had uh, a million uh, listeners and KDIA had five million, KFRC's million weighed as much 
or more than KDIA's five million because they didn't count uh, black listenership as a total listening audience. That's kind of how the advertising uh, industry uh, spun it. So yeah, it, and, and it pretty much remains the same today. There are a few uh, black owned stations that still exist. Stevie Wonder here in Los Angeles still owns KJLA, but they still continue to struggle uh, with trying to get advertising dollars and uh, support, whereas you have uh, one of the other mainstream uh, radio stations here that their whole playlist is black music, but they're classified as a junior market station. So they can still get those general market dollars with Stevie Wonder. So it's still it, it's yeah, still in still jacked up. And I think because it's more of his hobby and his personal money, I think that's why he's been able to uh, keep it and hold it for so very really long. But all of the other black owned radio stations here in Los Angeles. Wow, um, that is so strange because um, you know. Black folks spend money just like anybody else. I don't know. I mean, if you're a McDonald's, for example, or um, you know, a Time Warner Cable, one of those big companies, we eat just as many burgers and have cable TV, watch just as much TV, if not more. Um, that has to be intentional. That's not something that's just you know, happening. Oh, it's systemic. It definitely is intentional. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, it's systemically set up that way across most industries. You know, we yeah. don't, we yeah, don't pay a lot people. of attention because right. most people don't know the integral parts. They say, well, why don't black people have radio stations? Why don't black people get their own television station? And those of us who have, uh, it was a, a tremendous effort to hold it up. You know, we had a major uh, radio syndication. We uh, service 90% of the U.S. population had never been done before. Uh, we were 500 uh, affiliates. We had millions of uh, listeners, but we still could not get the advertising dollars that uh, a white or general market smaller syndicator uh, could get. And, and literally, we were forced out of the industry after 15 years. So that's what happened to a lot of the black owned media companies and radio stations. And they, uh, we were literally forced out of the market. And once they cut the affirmative action, that cut out all of the uh, vice presidents and presidents of major corporations. We got our big break with Chuck Morrison, who was the vice president of Coca Cola USA. And he commanded. Uh, a budget of maybe 50 to 100 million dollars. So just that one corporation, he was able to fund all of uh, the black programming and he's the one that funded us for 15 years. But after they started knocking those people out of position, it kind of went back to the 50s where they said, no, oh, white guy can do this. We can do this in general market and we'll just do general market buying and we'll sweep up the black audience, kind of like they do advertising now. The advertising agencies are predominantly 95% white and they may do a commercial and they may put a black face in it or they may uh, play a, a r and song under it. But most of the major money and funding is not going to the artist or even uh, the one black actor, but by doing that, they say, okay, well, we can pick up all the black uh, people. They'll buy McDonald's anyway, because see, we have a, a black person in the commercial. So we don't necessarily have to spend additional dollars in black media to get black consumers. And that's kind of how they justify uh, doing it the way they do. And unfortunately, it has worked. Yeah. You know, because we don't we don't understand the specifics. So we say, well, okay, McDonald has a black person in the commercial, so they must be down. You know, or we would be here and playing uh, Hurdy through the grapevine under the the bed of the commercial. So it's down, and they yeah. kind of use that psychology. Um, yeah, I mean, you see it all the time. I, I, yeah. 
um, look at um, you know Popeye's Chicken, a Canadian company, and they have the sister in there talking about y'all shall get my chicken. You know, it, so, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's funny how it's funny how um, how we're so easily influenced as a people. You know, we don't. We just like you said, we see somebody out front and think, oh, okay, well, they must own Popeye's chicken, you know, or you know, they must own McDonald's, you know, and we don't think beyond, um, beyond that. So, well, yeah, and they, they, it's an effort to keep us uneducated and unknown. So, that's the other thing they try, they spend a lot of money to keep us kind of like, oh, it's not the we see no color, you know, it's a colorblind society, but under, right under that, the undercurrent is something different because true, they are, are paying um, actors, to a black actor to be in the commercial and yeah, they are licensing R&B music to put under the bed. So those couple of people did all right, but what you don't see is the billions of dollars that they're giving to ABC and CBS and CNN and KGO and all of that's where the big money goes. And um, we're just not at that table, yeah. you know? And, and unfortunately, uh, the pendulum is swinging back. See, my generation thought that once we swung the pendulum this far, it would keep swinging. So my uh, kids and their kids, kids and your kids, kids, the could uh, advance as we went along. But what I've learned and, and seen over my uh, career is that the pendulum swings to a certain point and then it swings back. And then we kind of go to that certain point again and instead of crossing over to the promised land, it swings back. And so unfortunately I'm saying all of the games that we made um, in the 60s and 70s, swinging back to, it's, it feels like, the, well, I wasn't here in the 50s, but it feels like that generation right before we started that dance. It's definitely going back. Mm. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. It kind of turns kind of negative. <laughs> Not to bring you down. <laughs> That's a little discouraging. Uh, Not to bring you down, but yeah. I want it is swinging back, but we have to fight. It's like, we we always thought that it was a, a solid, you know, once we made it to this point, this is just nailed in the stone, but it's not, it's kind of fluid. Mm -hmm. So you always have to keep pushing uh, forward because once you stop, they start pushing you back. And so, the one uh, good element I see out of all of this is uh, things like you're doing now, uh, what we call new media, or new black media here. Right. Uh, we're finding other avenues uh, to invest in, develop, and, and monetize. And that's really how black radio started in the beginning because in the 50s it was all white radio stations that had no ratings or had uh, poor signals or whatever else. So they kind of sold them to black people. And then we built them into the powerhouses that they became. And then they came back and destroyed them because we built them into those powerhouses. I think these types of formats that we do now and, and the, everyone on um, YouTube and, and the different programming aspects is almost like a pioneering beginning of black radio on another platform. Right. So I can see uh, us building audiences here, uh, monetizing, creating uh, future stars, doing the very same thing that they did in the building blocks of Black Radio. I can see it happening here because the one thing they really can't stop uh, Black people and our uh, gumption and our drive. You know, every time they put something in front of us, we kind of go around, figure out something else, recreate it, and throw it out. <laughs> and that's kind of like the music scene now. You, you say rap, you talked about rap earlier. Actually, rap has become general market. Mm. So there are more white people that buy what they call rap and hip hop now because it's really not the same 
as it was in the 90s. Right, I agree. It's a whole different ball game and general market trip. And so I think that's why the numbers and of course all of the new media aspects that we have to self-promote. Um, but I'm very concerned about hip hop. It's got to turn around. It's got to uh, recalibrate because it really is the music of young people and it is driving me crazy. And um, it is. <laughs> like, what are you guys doing? I mean, you know, it's a frequency. Everyone knows that, you know, black people were on a frequency. That's why a song could be number one in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Tech, uh, Houston, you know, and none of us had never talked or seen right. anyone. Right. I could hear the record in Oakland and say, oh, this is the hit. And someone could hear it in New York because we're on a frequency. And we once we kind of connect with each other, we're like there. And so uh, unfortunately, what a lot of uh, <clears throat> sinister uh, white people did is they saw the power of our music and they saw how it moved us and and uh inspired us and they kind of went back and put some texture into it and now everybody's just like this you know everybody's on pain everybody's on bad everybody's on this everybody wants to kill everybody wants to kill. and that's literally uh subliminally programmed into our young people because you know we're old enough to say, you're not gonna listen. but you right. know when when we were their age, I mean, we loved Prince. We knew every word. You know, I remember the Richard Pryor album. We'd sneak, you yeah, know, and listen exactly. to oh, oh, So I get it, but it wasn't on mainstream. It wasn't right. being pumped and promoted right. like it is now. So that's why I said, I, I, I'm, a, I'm concerned about rap and hip hop. And, and I do believe that we're going to start seeing a move to kind of counter that, I hope. I hope so, and I don't necessarily um, uh, dislike um, rap or hip hop, but I, but like you said, when you know when rap first came out, it was generally very positive, and I just think there needs to be a balance. I don't, I don't hear the balance. I there hear, is no balance. and if there is, they don't get the attention. Right. It's almost right. like. Craziness is really uh, rewarded now. Right. You know, back when we were in radio, there were certain records, you know, because we controlled what the black audience heard, and because we had standards, there were certain things we would not play, period. You know, I don't care, we don't, whatever, it's not gonna, but that kind of got wiped away with the homogenizing of our culture because we were very stern about good music and what it was saying and how it was represented and because we control that you know you guys were the gatekeepers of exactly we were definitely and once they took that away there really are no gatekeepers now it's just kind of who can be the wildest who can be the craziest who can expose the most who can, you know that's not that's kind of gimmick Right. to me that's not really artistry to me but now it's kind of more of a circus atmosphere the more flamboyant uh, you are the more highly you're rewarded but it certainly doesn't have a lot to do with straight down yeah i agree i agree you know back in well i don't date us too much but uh, <laughs> you know i'm already dated <laughs> right, <laughs> don't <right>. date you <laughs> But, um, you know, I, again, it was, uh, I guess now it's more, like you said, fluff or gimmicky or, uh, but back then it was just music, you know, Raw talent. just music. And, Raw talent. You know, and like you said, we all can pretty much agree on an Al Green song or a TP song or a Michael Jackson song. I love it. It you know, was, we was in harmony that. together, right? Exactly, exactly. And when I was on radio, I think the first white song we ever played was AWB. And it was like the only one on the chart. And no one knew AWB was a white person. Right, exactly. <laughs> Until they 
But so it, uh, it was just a different time in Canada. We really looked out for our communities and our culture uh, because like I said, that was really our front line of, of resistance were the personalities on, on the radio across the country. And the funny thing is that we didn't really talk to each other. Right. But we were real in step with what's a hit and what's not. Right. And uh, it really worked well. Yeah, I agree. So tell us a little bit more about uh, what you're doing now. Well, I'm doing documentary films now. We just oh. uh, finalized uh, Ancient History Hunters Straight Out of America, which was a documentary based on my uh, father's indigenous ancestry. Uh, and uh, we were selected uh, out of a genetic testing out of Canada uh, because he had a rare blood type. And so what we found out is that uh, he was indigenous to the Americas and that they had been here uh, based on this new uh, uh, genealogy testing for over 50,000 years. So we created a uh, documentary film uh, showing all of the elements of the indigenous Americans uh, before uh, Columbus. So that's a project that we just finalized. It aired, it premiered, I think, February 21st. And so, uh, there's this guy kind of walking around. So I couldn't, so I kept lifting him up. Um, so we created this documentary film that uh, gives the history, the ancient uh, antiquity history of the Americans. So that was our last project. And uh, we're currently working on an ancient America encyclopedia, which is uh, beyond Wikipedia. What we're finding is that a lot of the history, as you know, has been uh, erased, uh, twisted, lied, or whatever. So we're putting together uh, some people out of uh, Canada, uh, some folks down in the islands, uh, some indigenous people out of there, uh, Alaska, as well as North and South America getting together and creating an encyclopedia where we can uh, showcase additional knowledge that's kind of been eliminated from the history. So it works on that. Okay. And another documentary film about the uh, hidden history of San Francisco, which is mm. amazing. Okay. Uh, where can people find the uh, your documentaries at? They can uh, go to ancienthistoryhunter.com uh, we're also on Instagram, A History Hunter, and you can follow us on uh, Facebook. And okay, and we'll put links um, to all of your stuff on the show notes on our YouTube channel and also on our website. Um, well, uh, Miss Blackman, um, this it's was been a great. Real time. It's been real. <laughs> My home girl from Vallejo. Uh, I gave you my first uh, podcast. Oh, so okay. All right. Well, I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you joined. Um, anything else you want to add before we uh, before we end this show? Well, I love soul music. Thank you so much uh, for carrying on the legacy. I'm looking forward to speaking to you more in depth about the documentary that uh, you're producing and, and now I'm in production. And I think that we've covered quite a bit yeah, for we our did. first episode. We, so we got to have you back. I, please have me back. I would love <laughs> to come back. I, I've certainly enjoyed this, and I, I hope I've been able to um, share uh, some knowledge and enlighten and, and, and really to uh, say we got to keep soul music alive and 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 there are many 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 great talented uh, people still i mean there is no limit to the talent mm -hmm. in black america so we just have to continue to create platforms to showcase those with talent and um continue to build our platforms and our audiences so we can uh, speak uh to the nation uh, I think I agree. that's all I would like to say. Just keep soul music alive. It is the beginning and the end. 
I hear you. So I really appreciate you for that. Yeah, and what Diane's referring to um, here at uh, Bring Back Soul Music, we are producing some documentaries on some of the greatest R&B albums of all time. And Diane has been kind enough to, uh, I guess, consult with us, I should say. Um, and the first album we're doing is Michael Jackson's Thriller. So hopefully that'll be out probably mid-June. So I'll be on the lookout for that. Um, but Ms. Blackman, I appreciate you. Thank you, Todd. I really appreciate you. Thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. And you have a, a wonderful rest of the evening. And keep me, keep, keep me in mind when you, when you need some additional uh, input. Oh, are you kidding? You, you're going to be my source. Yeah, right. Mr. Uh, Barry Pope. Um, so I got to with him exactly. Um, so, but well, we're gonna make this happen. So, I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you. For that. All right, and that's Diane Blackman on the Bring Back Soul Music podcast, and we'll be right back. Calling all lovers of soul music! The time to make soul music relevant again is now. You've been listening to the Bring Back Soul Music podcast with Todd Woodson. If you enjoyed today's show. Be sure to tell a friend. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to our newsletter at bringbacksoulmusic.com. Well, that's our show for today. I'd like to thank my special guest, Miss Diane Blackman. You can find out more about Diane on our website at bringbacksoulmusic.com. Don't forget, you can listen to the Bring Back Soul Music podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Bring Back Soul Music TV. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at comments at bringbacksoulmusic.com. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Todd Woodson. See you next week.